Thank you for, for having me and for inviting me here. Um, I'm going to start off, if I can, a little bit off piece and talk a little bit about how we position young people and their experiences in the digital world. And I'm going to open with a, a super bold statement. Um, and that is, bear with me, the digital world offers huge opportunities for young people and we can and should be unleashing innovation to really maximise these opportunities. The digital space, it, it can be an incredibly amazing vehicle to both realise and advance young people's rights, whether that's their right to information, to education, to leisure, to expression, you know, their rights to the future, if you will. It offers this, like, I don't know what you'd call it, like a, a comprehensive vision of citizenship that the old, you know, in real life world just, just hasn't been able to give them. Young people have for a long time been denizens of the sort of real world, politically disenfranchised and, and too often marginalised. And the digital world offers a chance to really challenge some of these practices that sees young people systemically left out. Now, that thought, I think starting from that position, um, is possibly a really fruitful way to reopen up the, the conversation, to reopen up our question and answer session, because it's less about protecting children in the digital world, which is a kind of sort of, I don't know, like a, a fear-based nervous framing that leads us to try and think about like minimums of protections and, and, and what we can do, um, to a positive, really active framing that opens up the possibility of thinking about maximums of capability, if you will. So Nishan opened up, you know, by talking about needing to move from what was it? I think it was like a cyber security framing to a sort of more comprehensive framework. I'm suggesting we go beyond that again and move beyond safety into a kind of um, children and young people as rights bearing citizens perspective. And this opens up a lot more space for young people's agencies. They aren't passive, you know, non-player characters in this digital world. Um, that we're all running to try and save, they're agentic and can and should be active parts of making this new digital world. Um, and so they're not our children to protect, they're their own people. As Giselle described this, it's stakeholder preparation taken to its sort of logical end conclusion. Um, and when we start from there, the, the sort of task I think of, I don't know, of like, Realising it advances young people's privacy and addressing the very real risks of social media becomes a slightly more involved, um, but definitely more exciting process. And the risks are real. I'm not sort of glossing over that in some sort of polyadderish, you know, tech utopianism. Um, I've been asked to sort of describe some of the risks that I've uncovered in micro experiments and research projects. Um, and I will talk about three of them. But what I want to do is reframe them a little bit and think about how seeing young people as non-player characters in and of itself might have contributed to that risk and how flipping our vision might help prevent some of these risks in the first place. So the three risks that I've been documenting recently that young people experience in terms of privacy and um, social media specifically, um, are, are firstly in July, um, earlier July this year, so just a few weeks ago, working with a consortium um, of organisations across 14 different countries. I wrote a short report um, looking at what we've described as design discriminations or the different levels of safety and privacy that platforms offer young people based on where they're from. So we documented, for example, that if a 17 year old is in Germany and they open up a new Instagram account, Instagram defaults that account to a private account because, paraphrasing from Instagram's own blog here, Private accounts are one of the best ways to prevent unwanted contact between minors and stranger adults. But if a 17-year-old in Ghana or Indonesia or even the US opens up an account on Instagram, um, they don't get defaulted to private. They just get a little screen allowing them to choose between private or public. So this choice of what happens, of what happens to 17-year-old's accounts, embodies a direct conflict between young people's best interests which are better served by private accounts that maximise both privacy and safety, and commercial interests, which are better served with public accounts that maximise engagement, if you will. And in some countries, platforms are choosing young people's best interests, while in other countries, those same platforms are prioritising their commercial interests. It's Giselle's half-swept stairs in actions. But where platforms are choosing young people's best interests, it's not by random. Design discriminations largely affect young people outside of Europe. 
because Europe's regulators have acted to demand these sort of minimums of protection. It's the stick, as Giselle put it. And let me be clear, the stick works. Um, we've seen this as proof that the stick, more than anything else, drives up the protections that we've got. But why is it that young people elsewhere don't have their rights realised by these companies in the same way? I mean, sure, there's the kind of obvious one of, you know, the business model sucks. Um, corporate greed means that they'll put their best interests first. There's a the kind of obvious one. Um, but at a more philosophical level, are what we're seeing, you know, is this the kind of inevitable consequence, if you will, of the game that we're playing, the game of young people's privacy and safety being played by these characters of advocates, lawmakers, regulators, big tech? And we're all gaming away to see what we can secure against our own set of priorities. What would happen? if young people were agentic characters too? What if, you know, would Instagram or TikTok or WhatsApp have thought fundamentally differently about turning on or off features in a limited way based entirely on the demands of regional regulators? I guess what I'm asking is, you know, it's, it's, a, big, it's a big question of, of how did we get here? How did we get to a place where publicly listed companies are choosing not to turn on privacy and safety enhancing features for African and Asian young people. Does young people's systemic long-term lack of power, their lack of visibility, their lack of agency have anything to do with that? The second risk that I wanted to flag um, and look at really quickly is how young people's data is harvested, then twisted and too often used in ways to profile them and create personal risks. So data that's pickpocketed from young people by the left hand is then packaged up and used to sell them back risks with the right hand. So I'm talking about things here like the ways young people's data is used by social media platforms to drive algorithms that serve them risky content or to drive algorithms that's, that advertise risky products. And I've run experiments in the last six months on both TikTok and Instagram that show that both of these companies will harvest data about 13 year olds about what they like and do online and use this data to recommend increasing levels of risky content, whether it's pro eating disorder content, manosphere content, or content that reinforces problematic ethnic stereotypes. Now, this isn't a sort of generic whine about these companies hosting awful content that bad people post. It's about these companies actively choosing to recommend this content to young people and doing so in ways that identifies and preys on their vulnerability to this awful content in the first place. And with exponential accuracy, whichever way you run these experiments, these companies will recommend increasingly, increasing amounts of troubling content for kids to watch. So in one experiment, for example, that we undertook a couple of months ago, I looked at politically divisive content, think white supremacy content, Q&N content, that sort of content in Australia. We polled, we looked at how algorithms were feeding it, and we also polled young people to see how far it spread. And we found that over three quarters of 16 and 17 year olds in our poll had seen this content. And we asked where and how they'd seen it. We found that half of the young people who had seen politically divisive content said they saw it because an algorithm said they should discover it. A further quarter said, it, said they saw it because they followed someone and an algorithm therefore placed it in their followers' feed. So this isn't about young people going looking for this sort of politically divisive content. It's about platforms, algorithms, actively profiling young people as potentially interested in this sort of divisive, problematic content and serving it right up. In other contexts, we call this behaviour grooming. And I'm going to quote Kelsey here, who's an amazing 17-year-old advocate from California, who described what it was like to have an Instagram feed filled with eating disorder content. She said, I knew I couldn't rely on Instagram to send me the positive messages I needed. I had to actively try and change my social media feeds. I had to do the hard work. Without my consent, Instagram pushes me towards it, but I have to pull myself away from it. Again, how did we get here? Would it be different if young people were seen as key stakeholders and had to be heard, had to input into the discussions about how algorithms really should rank content? And thirdly, the third risk I want to highlight really quickly, because I'm just going to back Ephraim in here when he talks about consent and terms and conditions, um, 
again, well, I think that consent is actually a really weak proposition to justify data collection. It is, as, as Ephraim noticed, the dominant legal and moral justification that we have. And this is, you know, in so many ways, this is deeply problematic. You know, can you ever consent to egregious violations of your rights? What does declining to consent look like in a digital world? Do you really have the option to decline? But let's take it at face value. In a quick report I authored last year called Did We Really Consent to This? We looked at um, the policies that 10 different platforms offer young users. We found again, as I framed did, 90% of them required a tertiary degree to read. And um, one of them was just, one alone, one platforms was just shy as being as long as two high school novels as recommended by the Australian Department of Education. Unsurprisingly, when we polled young people again, only 4% of teenagers um, said they read the terms and conditions that they agreed to. So can we really say that young people consented to this data collection and use? You know, when what they've consented to isn't even presented to them in a, in a way that would enable them to consent. Um, and no surprises here. Um, I, I think that if we did flip the script a little bit and understand young people as agentic actors, as active stakeholders, um, no one will be drafting 47,000 words of terms and conditions for them to read. And that is the length of TikTok's terms and conditions. I'm not just making that number up. So I, I think, I mean, overall, I think that if young people were repositioned, if we did see young people as not as non-player characters, but as active characters, as people who were engaged in designing and building this digital world, a lot of these sorts of risks would be mitigated. They simply wouldn't be designed in in the first place. But it would also go a long way to that more positive vision of reshaping the digital world in ways that unlocks and advances young people's rights in the first place. So I think what I'm calling for, I'm, I'm deeply aware of that what I'm calling for is a fundamental big rethink um, but ultimately, I think that that is possibly the most powerful intervention and really the only way to reshape the digital world in a way that makes it genuinely work for everyone.